So without further ado, let's dive into the agenda for my talk today. So I'm going to briefly discuss uh, what is the monolith and what are the microservices architecture. Then I'm going to do a kind of side-by-side -side comparison. I want to highlight some topics that I think are important. And then I'm going to dive into modular monoliths. How do you build them? What are some of the challenges of building them? And what are some of the lessons that me and my team learned along the way? Some of them, unfortunately, the hard way, but uh, I'm sharing them with you today so that you don't have to make the same mistakes. So behold the monolith. Uh, what we say when we mean a monolith, it's a software architecture where the entire application or the entire system is just one application. Or rather, the more important part here is there's only one deployment unit. Now, these days, it's considered old fashioned. Everybody wants to be working with some other type of architecture that I'm going to mention in just a moment. And you can say that it, ha it has um, limited scalability. I'm going to touch on this point in just a moment, uh, but bear, in, bear with me when I say limited scalability, I have something very specific in mind. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the microservices architecture. Here's a very interesting image where each one of these nodes is a specific service in some very large system. Uh, maybe this could be Netflix. I know they have something similar. So when we say microservices, we mean that we have many services um, comprising the entire system. Uh, these days, it's cutting edge and cool. Everybody wants to be working with microservices, even the, the people that are just starting out without really understanding what they are, what they solve, and why do we even use them. Uh, and when it comes to scalability, they are supposed to be much more scalable than monoliths, but let's see uh, what's really the case. So let's see kind of a side-by-side a -side comparison of monoliths and microservices. So when it comes to deployment units or deployment artifacts, uh, in a monolith system, you have just one deployment unit. And in a microservices system, you have many. Or rather, each service is its, is its own deployment unit. Now, when it comes to communication, again, it's very different. In a monolith, your components are typically going to communicate via method calls, which are synchronous and very fast. Uh, and in memory, that's important. Whereas with microservices, your services communicate with each other typically through network calls. Uh, this can be HTTP, gRPC, maybe uh, messages over a queue, whatever. But there's this component of uh, going over the network, which introduces some uh, interesting features that are part of microservices. Uh, when it comes to scalability, the monolith is typically vertically scalable. So we throw more resources into the machine that is going to host our monolith, and that's how we scale. Of course, we can always horizontally scale our monolith, but the downside to, of this is the uh, efficiency goes down. So when you horizontally scale a monolith, you're scaling the entire application where you don't necessarily really want to do this. Probably there's, let's say, 20% of your system that's really under high load. And this is the part that you want to scale. But because you're running a monolith, you can scale only that part. You also have to scale your entire application and you're wasting resources. With microservices, this, let's say, this 20% of your system that's under high load can be its own service, which you can then scale independently from the rest of your system for maximum resource utilization. Uh, usually in a monolith, we have one database. In microservices, we have many, usually one database per microservice. In Monolith, you have transactional guarantees because you're working with just one database. In microservices, you have to deal with eventual consistency, or you could try to make your microservices uh, strongly consistent, but you have to do two-phase commit or distributed transactions, and uh, you really don't want to go there. And one more thing that I want to highlight is how these architectures scale uh, with team size. So in your typical monolith, it's really hard to scale into a large team 
because uh, the individual components are going to be very interconnected. You're going to have tight coupling and you, uh, your uh, engineers are going to have a hard time uh, working with each other without um, causing trouble with what the other team is working on. Whereas with a microservice, uh, you typically have one, one or multiple services that are dedicated to each team, and then it scales really nicely. If you need to add more services, you can distribute them, distribute them along your existing teams, or you can introduce a new team that's going to develop that service. So with that comparison in mind, here's a very nice quote from Martin Fowler. He says, you shouldn't start a new project with microservices, even if you're sure your application will be big enough to make it worthwhile. And I think it's really important to have this in mind whenever we are developing a new system um, and just try to think about why he said what he said here and what he meant behind it. I'm going to kind of um, unpack this quote in the, the rest of my talk as I talk about modular monoliths. Uh, but the tendency when going microservice first is you're probably going to make a lot of mistakes along the way that may be a little bit difficult to fix if you're doing microservices straight away. Whereas if you were going with a monolith, you can then decide how you're going to move into microservices and make uh, a more informed decision that's going to make it easier for your system to scale as time goes on. So what if we could have the best of both worlds? If we could get the physical architecture of a monolith, so we have just one deployment unit, one database, transactional guarantees, all that, all that good stuff, and we could get the logical architecture of microservices. So we have modularity, we have the ability for teams to work independently on the same unit of code. I know it seems uh, like I'm over exaggerating, but this is really possible. And a bonus that you get with what I'm going to propose as the solution, but you obviously know what, it, what I'm talking about, is you get the ability to move really easily into microservices. So the architecture that offers all of these qualities is called a modular monolith. And it's not really a new thing. Uh, it's something that we as engineers have forgotten how to do properly. Uh, and I think it's important that we, we talk about this architecture some more. So what is a modular monolith? I'm going to throw a few boring definitions your way, uh, and then we're going to try to unpack them. So a modular monolith is a software design approach in which a monolith is designed with an emphasis on interchangeable modules. So I'm sure you all now know what the modular monolith is and I don't need to talk anymore, right? No, uh, I was as confused as you are probably when reading this quote. So here's another one that's even better. Uh, it's an explicit name for a monolith system designed in a modular way. So, <laughs> so let's try to uh, unpack this a little um, by focusing on the on the word modular. It, it kind of seems to be the center point of this architecture. Uh, so the definition for modular is something consisting of separate parts that when combined form a complete whole. I'm, going, I'm not going to read the rest. I want to highlight a few parts here. So consisting of separate parts, that's one thing. And then they are combined to form a complete whole. So this is the idea behind modular monoliths. You divide your system into individual modules that are independent, that can work together. And then you combine them into this monolith application, which is a single deployment unit, and you get your entire system, right? Your running application. So let's see uh, in, a, in, a, in a little more detail uh, what this looks like. So here's um, a C4 diagram of your typical monolith system. It's uh, simplified on purpose just to, to paint the point. Um, you have one component, which is your backend code, your application, and there's a single database. So this is, you know, in simple terms, what a monolith is. 
uh, it's a single deployment unit, usually just one database. And then on the other side, you have your microservices where you have a few individual components, which are, I'm going to just name the, uh, the order component or service, the catalog customers and collaboration services. So we're talking about some eShop system and each one of these services is responsible for a specific part of the features that the entire application is supposed to offer. Now with microservices, these components or feature sets are nicely coupled inside of their own service. Whereas with the monolith, they're all kind of jumbled together in one component, which is difficult to, can you hear me? It sounds a bit, uh, which is difficult to, to reason about. Um, so here's what the, the same system would look like in a modular monolith architecture. You see the same kind of components where which were previously in the microservices diagram, but this time they are not services, they are modules. So we have the orders module, the collaboration module, the catalog module and customers module. And notice that each one of them has a very distinct boundary, which is supposed to highlight that these are independent components. And then all of these modules together form the entire system and underneath them, there can be one database or more. I'm going to talk uh, more in depth in just a moment. Uh, and I see a few of you uh, taking photos. Uh, I'm going to share the, or I'm going to find a way to share the slides with you later so that you can have uh, the, the image in high quality. Um, so with that diagram in mind, uh, let's see what are the challenges of building a system using a modular monolith architecture. So the first challenge that you have to solve is you need to define what your modules are and decide what are your bounded contexts. Then you need to solve how your modules are going to communicate with each other. There are some trade-offs there that you you're, are going to have to make. Uh, so you win some, you lose some. Uh, and another problem that you're going to have to solve is the independence of data in your database between your modules and how you're going to isolate these data, this data from other modules. So let's kind of uh, tackle each one of these challenges and see how we actually build a modular monolith. So the first part is defining modules. And what a module really represents is a cohesive set of functionalities. Now I'm using the Domain Driven Design Book, because it introduces the concept of a bounded context. And a bounded context really represents just a boundary, right? Or in our case, a module in which uh, a, part a particular domain model applies. So let me try to, to give you an example. Uh, we had an orders module. So in that module, we are most certainly going to have some person or some uh, human. Sorry, it sounds super strange. Is it better now? Yeah. Uh, the mic is not cooperating with me. Um, so we're going to have some person that's going to be in that particular module. And in an order module, it's going to be the concept of a customer, right? Inside of that bounded context, you have a customer. And then in some other bounded context, let's say the payment system or the payment module, that same customer, physically that entity, is going to have a different context, a different name. Let's say it can be a payer, right? Because this is the concern of the payment module it wants to know what a payer is, and the order module wants to know what a customer is, even though at the end of the day, it's still kind of the, the same uh, entity, the same person, the same concept. So I hope that uh, kind of clarifies the, the point. Uh, I also suggest that you read the book from Eric Evans, uh, if you already didn't. 
another interesting thing to consider is that we can treat each module as it's separate as a separate system as an individual application or you can look at it as a subsystem in your larger system so having that in mind that each module can be its own subsystem it means that you need to decide what kind of architecture on a system level or rather project level you want to apply so you have absolute freedom uh, to choose what whichever architecture you want you can do a typical layered architecture with three or more layers you can do the clean architecture or onion architecture which is popular these days mm, or you can also do the vertical slice architecture where you're grouping together all of the files related to a single feature in kind of the uh, the same file or the same folder and then your entire project is a cohesive set of individual features so you're very flexible in what project level architecture you can apply in your modules and then you take it from there an excellent example of what a modular monolith looks like is this repository uh, you can google a modular monolith with ttv and you can find the github repo that i recommend you go through because it's going to make a lot of sense or rather i hope it's going to make more sense uh, because I'm talking in more uh, theoretical here, uh, but you see it in practice and kind of all starts to make sense. Um, the next challenge, after you have decided which bounded context you want to represent in your modules, and you have ideally chosen an architecture, is to decide how your modules are going to be talking to each other. So the only rule and the one you can't break is that your modules are only allowed to call the public API of the other modules in your system. So the public API can mean a lot of things uh, because we're all .NET developers. You can think of it as an interface for some service, uh, which at runtime is replaced with some implementation that is provided for dependency injection. And then let's say module A, or let me use a real example from the diagram. Let's say the orders module wants to get something from the catalog module. The catalog module is going to expose some public interface that the order module will be able to call and get the information that it requires, or maybe even trigger, send some command and trigger some operation. So other than the public API that one module exposes, you are not allowed to reference anything inside of the other modules so why i'm stressing this is because you're still working in a monolith system uh, in our in our world this is a solution which contains multiple projects inside and there's really nothing preventing you from just hacking your way around and referencing some other project and taking something from another module but you really should not do that uh, there are ways to prevent this uh, in write tests you can write architectural tests that kind of check this and your kind of last line of defense is code reviews but uh, you really want to move as much of that as you can into the test part because you get instant feedback and you write them once and they always just work with code reviews you're uh, expending a lot of time to make sure that your architecture isn't broken um, and other than the public API that a module exposes, you want to be getting as much. It's breaking, right? I'm trying. <laughs> you want to be hiding uh, as much implementation details as possible inside of your modules. Um, you want to use the internal keyword as much as possible. Uh, you want to use assemblies where you're splitting your, uh, the implementation details that you want to hide into, into uh, individual assemblies that are not allowed to be referenced from other modules. So these are some of the ways that you can achieve what basically is encapsulation. Now, when it comes to the 
practical side of implementing the communication between modules, you have really um, two options. Uh, one is just using simple method calls. So your module exposes an interface. The other module calls that interface, which is just an in-memory call, fast, it's synchronous, and you get information back. The You can only call the public ABI of other modules. I just mentioned that. Uh, the downside of this approach is you're introducing runtime coupling. So if you're one module, in this case, the orders module is injecting some interface from the Hmm? Oh, it's back. It's back. It's okay and everything. Should we try some more? We can have this. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Some technical problems. Um, so what I mean by runtime coupling is whenever you're injecting a service from some other module, you're going to get an implementation that is provided to you at runtime, and you're coupled to that implementation without maybe being aware that you're depending on some service that is implemented in the other module. And why this is a problem is whenever you decide to move from a monolith system, or in our case, a modular monolith, into microservices, this implementation is going to break because now your implementation of the public API is moved into an independent service. So let's say we want to move the catalog module outside into its own service because we want to scale it further, but we're depending at runtime on some services that are provided by that module. Now you're going to get compile errors at runtime or runtime errors, um, and you're going to have to switch that implementation with something that can do network calls. So that's the downside. On the, the other option for implementing communication between modules is using messaging. So this is asynchronous, obviously. You're going to be using some sort of message bus underneath, and your modules are going to be sending messages between each other. It's also possible to implement a remote uh, procedure call uh, kind of request using messages, where one module sends a request, the other module listens to that request, then the other module sends a response, and you get kind of like a, a synchronous, a fake synchronous call over the message bus. So a library that kind of encapsulates this really nicely is uh, Mass Transit. Uh, I'm hoping you've heard of it. It's a really great library for uh, working with uh, message brokers. Um, so how with messaging, uh, the public API of a module becomes a message contract. So either an event or a command, uh, an event that something occurred in your module that you want to inform the other modules in your system of what happened, or a command message that you want to, I don't know, it keeps breaking, that you want to uh, invoke some process in the, in the other module, so you send a command. So how you can share these if you want complete um, separation of your modules is by having uh, NuGet packages that you can version, which are going to contain your message interfaces, and then you can spread them around your team. Or you can have, because we're still in the same solution, just uh, expose that uh, assembly that should contain your public messages uh, with the other modules. So the benefit here is this implementation is decoupled. And if you ever decide to separate any module into its own microservice, this is going to just work out of the box because you don't introduce any dependencies at runtime. You're just depending on messages over a message bus. So whenever I say, let's say I want to take the order module this time, I can move it into its own service 
and all the communication between the other modules is still going over the same queue and that's just going to work. So it's really lovely in that regard. So I've been talking about communication between modules, but another important aspect is data independence between modules. So every module is responsible for its own data. Pretty, pretty similar how in a microservices system, every service is responsible for its own database. Uh, the same concept applies here. So you want your modules to be independent and you want them to be responsible for their own data. To be able to support this, uh, you can't allow direct querying of the data from other modules in your application. Again, because we're working in a monolith system, you're going to probably have one database to start out. So again, there's nothing really preventing you from just writing a select statement that's going to fetch some data from the module that does not belong to you. But again, you shouldn't do this because it's going to introduce coupling and you're going to make your modules dependent with each other. And it's even worse if you're not aware that this is going on because it's easy to miss. Uh, and you find out you have a problem when you decide to do a migration to microservices. And when it comes to isolating data between modules, you have quite a few options to, to choose from. Uh, with each option, you gain something, you lose something. So let's see what they are. So the first kind of level of data isolation is no isolation. So, so all of your modules are hosted in all of, all of the data for your modules is in the same database and there's no visible separation between these tables. Everything is kind of together, so it's hard to reason about. So the next level up is still using the same database, but now you're introducing schemas for your modules. So in your application, you already have this logical separation into individual modules. And then at the database level, you introduce schemas that are mapping one-to-one -one between your modules. So, and then the same rule applies that I just mentioned earlier. You're not allowed to, let's say, uh, in the order module, you can't query anything that is outside of, your, outside of the order schema. So this is how you achieve kind of logical separation, right? There's still nothing preventing you from cheating around the system, but you really shouldn't. Um, and then the next level, if this wasn't enough isolation, uh, you can use entirely different databases. Uh, in this example, let's say these modules are still using this database system. So let's say we'll be using something relational, maybe server or Postgres. Uh, so at this level, you're splitting your modules into separate databases, but you're still using the same uh, database management system. And in the last level of data isolation, you're having both separate databases and then separate database management systems. So this is a really nice uh, feature for the monoliths, uh, where you can pick the database that suits what you're doing in your module. So let's say in some sort of payment module where you can't really uh, delete any data, data is only appended, you might want to use uh, event sourcing and some sort of database that supports event sourcing out of the box, uh, like event store, or you decide to build your custom solution. Uh, let's say in the catalog module, you have a lot of unstructured data so you're, you opt to use uh, some sort of document database. Uh, so you really have a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility uh, when it comes to how you want to isolate your data. And then lastly, I want to discuss some of the lessons that, that we learned uh, along the way. So lesson number one was spend more time uh, defining module boundaries because it's really going to pay off later into the project. Uh, what I mean by this is try to 
think in more detail about your system and how you want to split your modules. So one of the tendencies that uh, we have as developers is to make our modules maybe a little bit too granular. So either we end up with too many modules and this is going to show up in another problem that I'm just going to mention in a moment. Um, or rather, I'm going to mention it right now. So another issue that we ran into was the what I called chatty modules. Uh, you have the same kind of problem in microservices where you have two modules in the system that are constantly sending requests to each other. They are very chatty. They're either uh, requesting data frequently from from uh, one module. One module is frequently requesting data from the other module, hence chatty. So in in when you see that something like that occurs, it's a good sign that your modules are probably too granular and you want to, to merge them together into a single module. And I kind of skip over the second point. So uh, eventual consistency was a really awesome feature that we kind of embraced uh, right from the get-go in our project. Uh, but it really came to bite us when a few months down the line, we ran into a problem where uh, two modules that were eventually consistent could not be. So because of the business constraints, we had to make them immediately consistent, and then we ran into a problem. So how you can solve that is either by merging the modules together, so you make them one module, uh, you can use uh, a shared database where uh, you have access to transactions and then you can make a transaction between these two modules. But the problem is you're introducing coupling, so you won't really be able to, to separate these modules at, at any time without introducing problems. And the last pain point that we have, that we had, was how we shared data between modules. Um, I discussed earlier the options for how you communicate uh, between modules, so either using method calls or using messaging. Uh, the same applies for how you're going to share data. You're either going to choose to not have duplicate data, and anything that you need at runtime, you're going to go to the other module and fetch it by either issuing. Uh, a memory call, or you're going to send some message and then receive the data. Option. Um, I don't mind. Hmm? I'm just going. working what about now yeah okay so the microphones are not uh, going easy on me today uh, so I I was at my last point in how you share data between your modules so you can you can either decide to don't uh, to not duplicate any data and always fetch the latest, most fresh data at runtime, or you can introduce eventual consistency. So whenever something happens in one module, you publish some sort of message. The other modules are going to subscribe to that message, and then they can persist their own kind of uh, source of truth that is going to be relevant for, for that module. And probably if you're, um, if you want the, the biggest level of freedom, this is the approach that, that you should consider uh, because you can develop your modules completely independently of each other. You're not depending on the data in the other modules at all. You're only subscribing to messages and then you're persisting the, the data that you care about. Uh, the downside of this is obviously uh, your system is going to become eventually consistent. So there are ways of going around this, but um, 
it's kind of I don't want to dive uh, too deep into that. So I was going to jump into the Q&A section right away, but uh, I wanted to show you uh, some code. Uh, this is the My Meetings project, which is actually the repository that I mentioned earlier, uh, which implements the modular monolith architecture. Uh, I'm not sure, it seems you can see quite all right. So. Here's what the architecture like looks like when it comes to code level. So you have your one solution, which is your single deployment unit. So this thing here. And then you have your individual modules and kind of each one of them is its own separate uh, project inside of this uh, entire solution. So. This implementation here is using uh, an implementation of the of the onion architecture, of the clean architecture, if you will, uh, where uh, you have your domain project, your application project, and then your infrastructure project. And each module is exposing the integration events, which basically represents the public API of this module. So uh, you can see that each I'm going to actually pick this one. So let's say the user access module. So you have your domain layer or domain project uh, where you have the users feature folder and the user registrations feature folder. And then you have things like entities, repository interfaces, and most importantly, events. But the events here, so let me just open up one. So these are domain events, and they are published and handled only within the boundary of that module or that bounded context. And then when you need to interact with the other modules in your system, you have your public API, which are the integration events. So this user created domain event gets converted into a new user registered integration event which is published over some message bus. And then the other modules can subscribe to this event and decide what to do with it. So I wanted to go through a flow just to, to paint a picture. So I mentioned the user created domain event, which gets handled in the application layer, or rather the uh, confirm user all right. Uh, okay, this is the one. So without diving too deep into how the system works, uh, there's a user registration concept which gets confirmed and then a new user is registered in your system. And then you want to inform the other modules that something happened. So this handler is going to end up publishing the new user registered integration event. And let's say the payments module here is going to handle this event in the create payer flow. So this will register to the new user registered integration event, and then it's going to enqueue some sort of command. In this case, the create payer command, which is then going to persist a payer object or entity in that module. So this kind of uh, circles back into what I was talking about, where you have kind of the same entity representing different things in different bounded contexts. So in the user access module, you had the user, and in the payments module, you now have the concept of a payer, where at the end of the day, you'll see that we're propagating the user ID here that we generated in the user module so that you know that it's still the same entity just spanning different bounded contexts. So with that, I'll invite you to, to check out this uh, repository. It's a really nice implementation of what I talked about today. Uh, and you'll notice the the patterns that, that I was mentioning. And uh, we can move into the, the Q&A section.
Uh, when do you find it natural to split it into, for instance, a microservice? Is it based on teams or how many people you are? Or? Can I use this? Oh, yeah, I'll try to use this like as a microphone. Hopefully uh, you'll be able to hear me. So um, when do you want to, in, to move into from modular monoliths into microservices uh, should really depend on kind of like what your architectural drivers are and what are the requirements of your business. So let's say uh, one uh, quality of a microservice system is independent deployments. So you can take one service, make some change to it and deploy only that service without affecting anything in your system. Whereas with a modular monolith, you still only have one deployment unit. So if you want to make a change in one of your modules, you still have to deploy the entire application, right? So something like that. And then another concern would be uh, scalability. If you figure out that you've reached the limits of your modular monolith, or you really have one module that is under high load, uh, usually this is going to be on the read side uh, in the system. Uh, you want to take out that module and then scale it further uh, as a single service. Hello. Okay. I have a question regarding you. You you talking about uh, uh, ch chatty um, modules? Uh -huh. Can it also be the case that you actually model it uh, incorrectly? So it sh it it should have been um, like those two that are chatting should have been uh, two modules and another module not merging uh, the modules. Can you explain that a bit more? Let's say that you have some um, identity functionality or whatever inside both of the modules. So they are chatting a lot, um, but the problem is that there's actually a model, module inside both of them that should have been a separate module. So then you can end up falsely uh, merging the two modules you have because your conclusion is that those two modules should be the same. But if you, you could also be in a case where you model it uh, incorrectly, that it actually should have been three modules. So uh, just comment. Oh, so, so how would how would three modules help more? It wouldn't, but, but uh, um, you said that um, if they are chatty, you should merge them. But it's, I'm just saying it's not given. It yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, th that was um, uh, one solution, like merge them together, and uh, you solve the chattiness, and uh, you also solve the other issue that we had, which was we were eventually consistent and we couldn't afford to be. Um, another solution can be um, introduce caching, and cache data in one module, so you don't have to frequently go to the other module, um, and then whenever the data changes either invalidate the cache or, you know. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in, in the front. Yes, hello, uh, I was wondering about, excuse, so, sorry, about deployment. Uh, what kind of system is this? Is this a product that you sell and have multiple deployments with customers or is it an internal system? And depending on that, sort of how do you plan to handle future deployments if you restructure the system to pull more and more modules out of being to microservices? So, so the system that I'm referring to was um, an uh, internal application for um, a, a very kind of a bespoke uh, e-commerce system in, in the US. Um, they were, and this isn't going to sound sexy at all, they were selling kitchens, uh, but it's a really big business. Um, so we, there's really no, uh, you, you're not, selling it as a, a kind of a SaaS, right? So it's just a, a single monolith system, deployed as an entire, as a single unit. Um, and then the second part of your question was? Is it about the 
and then down to the space of my module, that is my services. But I get that part captured by you have a single deployment, that means there's a general system, so you have full control of yes. even these complications at the server level. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat it for so yeah, um, he said that, and uh, my short-term memory may not be great because I'm under pressure here. <laughs> that uh, because uh, I can repeat it if you want. That saying that since you have um, single deployment, then you also have full control of uh, doing the modifications you want on the architecture side along the way, which would not have been that simple if you had multiple deployments. So, yes. Okay, thanks. So, one of the things <clears throat> I am, um, you showed that you used eventing to handle communication between modules. So, my experience with events is that it, given a large solution or a complex domain, it could grow into something that's quite complicated to reason about. Do you have any tips or advice on how to manage that in a growing system? Like, how do I um, reason about what a command will do in the system? What ripple effects will it cause? Do you have any tips on how to manage that complexity? Yeah, um, so I, I guess that's kind of the, the natural side effect of a very large and complex system. You're going to end up with a lot of use cases and a lot of events that trigger downstream effects and such. Um, I don't know of something that explicitly solves that problem uh, other than uh, organizing your projects in such a way that it's really evident uh, what events you have in your system, then naming your events properly so that you can figure out, okay, this is the event when this thing happened, uh, then not reusing your events for uh, multiple kind of uh, state changes. Uh, it's sometimes attractive to reuse an event because uh, it's easy, it's the same event, and it's kind of the, a similar concept, right? Um, and it feels like duplication, introducing another event, but uh, you really should because it's a different concept. I know this goes uh, against <laughs> what you were just asking, um, but I think reusing events is going to be more complicated than having two events represent distinct concepts. Hi, in your example, you have only one Git repository, right? And uh, you have been working on your project as one team and not multiple teams. Yes. And the question how if you would grow to microservices, how you would maybe split your applications to work as one repository and go to uh, yeah, split in different repositories. I have been thinking about it all this about this. So so I mean um, you if you design your modules uh, so that they are independent in terms of they don't share data at the database level they talk to each other, ideally using uh, messages, uh, you're going to have pretty much an independent subsystem inside of your application. So you're not going to run into a problem where you have multiple teams, each working on one or a few modules, um, even in a single repository, right? Uh, but if you wish to, uh, you'd have to migrate the individual modules, into their own repositories, uh, migrating into a microservice system, and then you have to solve uh, if you introduced any dependencies uh, that were kind of easy to do in a solution, like referencing the project. Uh, you have to figure out how to solve that, uh, probably by sharing NuGet packages, that's one thing, or kind of uh, re-implementing the dependencies that you had in the other repository. Thank you. Yeah, at the front. Those damn plates. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit curious to why you seem to favor events over um, calling um, more of an API. Because one of the real benefits of doing this, the way I see it at least, 
is here using the tools, the, the compiler basically to help you to do compile time checks, to make it easier to follow your call stack and basically improve the developer experience by adding events and making the whole process asynchronous. That becomes a lot harder. And at least the way I see it, the, the argument for um, moving to microservices is not that valid because you could wrap that behind the same interface and the change would basically be minimal. So why? So um, one thing is coupling, right? Uh, when you have direct calls between modules, uh, let's say we're still in a monolith, this is a memory call, so all good. But when you move into microservices, this suddenly becomes a network call, which is an entirely different problem. Now you need to think about security. Is this one uh, service, which used to be my module, uh, allowed to call the other service? Uh, you need to think about uh, network failures because we kind of always assume that the other system is up and running, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, you need to know where the other service is uh, in terms of um, you need to know the address of the other service or uh, where the API is. Um, and yeah, you need to you need to um, think about error handling. So what happens if the API call crashes? Uh, I know this holds true uh, the same in the in the case where you're using messages. You still need to think about uh, failures, but um, it's easier to to scale uh, when you're using messaging because everything remains the same when you move into uh, microservices. Another argument, uh, or may maybe I'm a bit biased, but um, uh, we knew ahead of time uh, that uh, one of those uh, modules that we had was probably going to move into microservices, so that's why we decided to to model the system around events. In the back. Hi, hi. Uh, I have two questions. First, it will be very easy. How many projects do you have in your production solution? Um, I can't remember exactly, but it was between between uh, between sixty and seventy, something like that. Uh, the second question, how do you deal with uh, UI? Do you slice it uh, the same way as uh, business logic in the modular and keep it uh, close or some kind of other layer? So that was the responsibility of the UI team uh, and they did not apply the uh, modular architecture that we were using on the backend. Um, I have heard this question a few times. Um, but I'm not really uh, a UI guy, so I can't give you a valid answer. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. Yes, my question is, would you consider a modular monolith more secure or less secure than um, microservices architecture? Well, I, I would say more secure because you're dealing with one closed system, which is a single deployment unit running in some service. You don't need to think about individual services that kind of need to be allowed to work together. Um, there's less components of change, um, more so if you're using just a single database underneath, then your system is really tightly packed and I would say more secure. Wouldn't that uh, one deployment of the one set, uh, it would probably have, have, will have to have more access to stuff, like access to APIs, access to databases. Uh, you will kind of have to share some of the securities. Uh, oh, so meaning the, the the security guarantees? I, I agree that uh, like from the outside, it's yeah. more secure because you have one team you have to kind of <laughs> secure. <laughs> but uh, But that thing would, probably have to have access to a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking more from like external facing security, but what you're talking about is uh, there are a lot of moving parts in our system. There could be some cloud storage, some databases, some queues. So 
Uh, obviously, yes, that's one of the issues. Uh, we have to introduce some elevated uh, access uh, that would apply to all modules where this isn't necessarily the case. So um, both both kind of you get more secure from the outside, but maybe yeah. if you get compromised, you compromise more stuff, I guess. I have a question on my own. Uh, first of all, thank you, Milan. It is a great presentation. Um, you mentioned during the presentation about tests and kind of uh, aiming for shifting left on being able to detect more problems, potential issues uh, during tests. Your experience on like the different types of tests you have been using, what would you like recommend in case of a modular monolith? Like apart from like mainly unit tests and for instance, some end-to-end -end testing or yeah, what? So I, I, I would say the, the same holds true in regards to testing that uh, in any type of system. Uh, what I wanted to highlight was that you can use tests to enforce your architecture. Because you are working in a monolith system, it's relatively easy for developers to kind of break the architecture. So you can use architectural tests. I believe there's a library that's called uh, Net Arc Test um, that you can use to kind of validate that your references between your projects are what they should be. Any other questions for for Milan on the picture? <laughs> yes. He asks hard questions. You, you should take the mic from him. It's not really a question, more uh, an appreciation. Uh, I've spent a lot of my career, career cleaning up badly designed microservice projects. I think there's more badly designed microservice project than good ones. And I really like this approach because it's a lot easier to do refactors, a lot easier to clean up things that's gone wrong. And you always have the option of escalating to microservices when and if you need them. So I'm just showing my appreciation for more people talking about it, which again makes, uh, makes it easier for me to argue about why I'm doing it this way. Awesome, thank you. I, uh, I may have one question about data isolation you mentioned. Like, how are those like levels different? Because like how I understand it, like the single deployment unit has the access to all the databases because you can, I don't know, uh, at least I don't know the way to like. I'm not the only one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I really don't know the way to grant the access to only a single module, right? So what really prevents the module A from reading the data from the database that is like supposed to serve the module B? Like mm. how are those levels different? Because like you can use the same the, the database of the other module, you can use the schema of the other module because as a single deployment unit, you has the, uh, the rights to do it, right? Yeah, so I mean, if you try hard enough, you shouldn't, but if you try hard enough, it's really easy to break this architecture. Obviously, one thing we talked about just uh, now was um, the use of architectural tests to solve that. Uh, obviously, that's a good point that nothing's really preventing you from getting the connection string to this other database that you really shouldn't, and then just querying that. Um, but the problem with that is you're introducing coupling and you don't want to do that. Um, there really isn't a way in a single like solution to stop you from doing that, right? Uh, you can just, the best you can do probably would be to write some solid tests that would flag it immediately when something like that happens. Yeah, yeah my point, like from my perspective, like the only matter is the scale. If the database like really is not sufficient like maybe there is the point if in like extracting it for another module, but like personally we use just like prefix in table names to mm -hmm. remind which model which module the table serves. That's all. Yeah. All right. 
and then yes. Uh, one more question from my personal pain. Uh, what do you do when uh, you receive a requirement? I just need a page with a table with a few columns, but each column come from different uh, data owner from from different uh, modeler. So um, you want to aggregate data from a few modules and then expose it. Um, any any other constraints? In, th in terms of consistency? Uh, I mean, uh, when you comes with, come with a requirement when you need uh, uh, data from uh, different m uh, model models, but you, ha uh, you don't want to implement sort of views or select with the different tables, how do you deal with it? Do you uh, implement some new model which gathers that data inside it in order to show just the table with the three columns or some other ways. So I mean that would kind of depend uh, what you're trying to do. If this data really fits inside of a single module, you can decide to put, to put most of it there and then fetch the data that you're missing from the other modules to kind of complete the entire view. Uh, you can decide how you implement this. Uh, you can use either direct calls to the other modules to fetch the missing data and then persist everything at once. You can persist the data that you have access to and then fill in the missing data later on with some message based solution. Uh, but what do you prefer in your way? What do I prefer in the in the user interface? Was that the question? Um, so most likely if I could live with eventual consistency, I would choose the approach with messaging, but again, this is my preferred way. Um, if I needed to be immediately consistent, like as soon as I persist something in the database, I need the UI to reflect that. Then you would have to make kind of synchronous calls, collect all the data that you need, and then persist everything at once. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Well, I would like, it's not a question, it's more a appreciation. <laughs> Uh, statement uh, because I've kind of been a, a microservices guy and designed some microservices systems. But uh, lately I've been going on more, more and more using the modular monolith. And it's kind of because, first of all, a lot of Norwegian projects really isn't large enough to start by implementing microservices. Uh, and if you're going to start by using microservices, uh, you're probably not going to get the bounded contexts right straight away. So even if you do like event storming and do a proper modeling, you're going to fail on the first modeling. And you have to move stuff from one microservices to another. So modular monoliths will be, will be like a way to be able to model your bounded contexts within a small space and then figure out, okay, now we're somewhere and now, now we've figured out our bounded context and then we can break them out and the other thing we, that also like sam newman within the microservices space talks about is that you shouldn't use uh, microservices if it doesn't give you something that your current architecture doesn't give you so if you start by this module monolith that's within like a small uh, single deployment unit uh, then if you need to break out, it could be something like a, con a security concern that to say, okay, this module or this data has to have a higher security level than the other stuff. Uh, or it could be like this team over here needs to be totally autonomous, but you should have a real reason to break it out in a separate deployment instead of just doing it upfront. So that's kind of my take on starting with a module model it and then breaking it out because uh, you don't really know 
what microservices you should have when you start the project. So yeah. I agree. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a little bit follow up on previous one. Uh, we are consultants and quite often we have a customers which say, oh, you should develop it as a microservices. We come in and say, why? I say, oh, everybody does microservices. We are a modern uh, company. We have to do microservices. So what would be your short answer like to such non-technical person? Because you talked a lot about technical advantages, modular monolith, so, but how to sell modular monolith to the customer who want to do microservices? You just tell them this is like microservices, only it's one unit, one deployment unit. No, uh, jokes aside, so the value is you, you get most of the benefits of microservices and yet you're still working in a monolith, which is easy to work with, easy to reason about, and you still have the ability to move into microservices if you really need to. But at the end of the day, um, sometimes, you know, the, the, the customer comes first and you really don't have a choice. Uh, if they want to do something, um, you got to do it. But I would try to persuade them with every way possible that you really don't need this for the reasons that uh, I'm sure you're already aware of. Um, once and twice and I think Milan deserves a good round of applause thank you so much